Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Education Telescope on Leadership TV, where we explore topics and trends in education with the goal of shaping a brighter future for our children and society. I am your host, Zulehat Charter, and today we are going into topics that affect not only our classroom, but our country place in global education, land scale, curriculum reforms for future. Joining us today is our extreme guest, Mr. Olua Femi for La Pumile, head of school at Aduvie International School, with his extensive experience in both Nigeria and international education system. He brings a valuable perspective on the way curriculum reforms can help equip our students with the knowledge and skills they need to succeed globally. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank it's you. a pleasure. Thank, Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. Mr. Fola, can you start by sharing your thoughts on why curriculum reform is such a critical issue in Nigeria education today? Thank you very much for that question. Perhaps before I respond to that, it's important for me to comment the efforts of the federal government. Uh, just recently, uh, a new basic curriculum was announced by the federal government. And this curriculum will take effect, as you know, from January 2025. Um, part of the reasons why Nigerians are happy about this curriculum move is because for a while now, uh, we've been using literally an obsolete curriculum. This curriculum will incorporate, among other things, skill sets which will be very valuable for our children, particularly in this 21st century. Having said that, why is a curriculum review critical in Nigeria today? Well, for obvious reasons. So first and foremost, you will agree with me that a curriculum reform is not an event, it's a process. So it is an ongoing process. It's something you have to keep working at. Yeah. You never uh, finish a curriculum reform. You have to keep working at it in order to be able to keep up with the developments that characterize our world. That is one reason. Secondly, we need this review because there are lots of gaps in our teaching and learning system. And if there are gaps in our teaching and learning system, what that means is that uh, it undermines the quality of our educational system. Mm -hmm. So this uh, uh, talk about curriculum re uh, reform is actually very important so that we can have a top-notch educational system which can compete favorably with the educational systems in any other part of the world. Okay. So please, can you um, explain some key elements that define global standards in education and how does it impact students' readiness to, to this world? Okay. So when you talk about global standards, yeah. you want to take it from the Sustainable Development Goals. So the SDGs should be the basic standard that we're looking at when we talk about national, any national curriculum. Um, we are looking at SDG 4 in particular, which talks about equality, equity, education. Um, there is need for our educational system to uh, be inclusive, very, very important. There is need for our educational system to be engaging. And so when you are working out a curriculum, you want to make sure that, uh, well, I talked about inclusiveness, yeah. you want to make sure that it, it, it is diverse and it's able to cater to the needs of all the children who will be taught by that curriculum. Okay. So first of all, the SDG standard, SDG 4 in particular, and then secondly, you are also saying that for the curriculum to be standard, there is a need to, for it to be able to cater to the needs of every single child. And you know, children come 
from different backgrounds, yeah. from different shapes and sizes. Mm -hmm. So your curriculum needs to be able to uh, um, attend to the needs of those who are very intelligent, those who may not be very, very intelligent. And that is that brings us to the issue of vocational components. So the vocational education training is also important. Having all of these aspects in your curriculum makes it standard. So, sir, with the rising rate of um, private schools over Nigeria, how do you now introduce them to the standard of curriculum? Yes. Um, Sorry, let me cut you short because a lot, a lot of people can just use their one bedroom to start school and they'll just name it and that is it. Thank you very much. So, first and foremost, we need to pay attention to how people who intend to start schools go about doing so. Mm -hmm. And the government has put various standards in place under the Ministry of Education. So, uh, it shouldn't just be anybody who doesn't have the wherewithal who starts a school. There are things that the uh, Ministry of Education looks out for. There are processes, you know, that such people must go through. And uh, the Ministry will send a team of inspectors, you know, to inspect the facility, to inspect the equipment, the things that you need to have in place before the school can commence. Um, frankly speaking, that is not the case in some instances. We've seen, just like you said, situations where you have one room, you know, uh, facilities, and these are called international schools yes. for that matter. <laughs> yes. you know. So we need to be able to enforce those processes to the letter, yeah. just to ensure that we don't have charlatans coming in to form or to start schools. If we are able to put those processes in place and to implement them to the letter, it then becomes easier to begin to get the people who are qualified, who are supposed to start a school, given that they have everything in place, to key into the curriculum reform drive. So do you say um, the school environment have an impact on the curriculum reform? The school environment has a very, very huge impact. As a matter of fact, when you talk of the reasons why the curriculum reform efforts in Nigeria have suffered setbacks over the years, one of the reasons is because many schools have um, below standard learning environments, you know. So you, we've seen cases, for instance, where um, children are going through schooling under trees. Yes. But, but our parents actually did that, and they come out, they turn out well. Um, the world is changing. Yes. If we were able to get away with it 30, 40, 50 years ago, what you is the world saying today? today? Yeah. You know, and don't forget that we're trying to groom children who are going to compete. International standards. Against global standards. Yes. So you need a situation where facility-wise, environment-wise, you have everything in place so that these children can go out confidently and challenge their peers out there. So yes, I would agree with you. Environment plays a very, very major role. So what's what practical step can Nigerian school and policymakers take to make our curriculum more globally competitive? So to make our curriculum more globally competitive, um, what I would advise is implementation. So it's one thing to have the curriculum document. It's another thing to implement it. And I think one of the greatest challenges that our curriculum implementation or curriculum uh, 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 reviews, curriculum uh, reforms face is a problem of implementation. Yeah. So, for example, uh, I could remember in uh, 1983, 
when um, Professor Rock came up with the idea of the 6334 curriculum system. Now, at that time, the plan was that most of you know the curriculum will first be taught for three years yeah. using the local language. Oh, the local languages in the areas where they are being taught. Okay. I'm not sure if that ever happened. I don't think so. You understand? Because yes. many of us went to school in various places. I yes. schooled in the north. Yeah. And uh, as far back as late 70s, I was in primary school. I started primary school. I don't remember being taught with Hausa. But my my, my yeah. mom said it. Then there was a book my mom had. And because and from, I'm from Kogi State, and it appears I'm um, um, Ebra. Like every language, there's this book that she have, like my your head, your shoulder, your knees, and your tools, and it is being written in every language. Yes, but but you know we it's so when we say that maybe that implementation wasn't strong enough, it doesn't mean that some local some some localities it's implemented. Not adapted, yeah. yeah, some localities must have implemented. But I'm giving you an example where I school. Mm -hmm. I finished schooling in the north. I finished my primary school. I think in 1983. Wow. And I don't remember being taught in Hausa language. Do you understand what I'm yes. saying? So again, it, it, it brings to question the problem of implementation. So if we're able to implement, and I'm saying this just randomly, if we're able to implement 50% of what we have documented, I am too, too sure that Nigeria would have gone much further than where we are today. So there is need for us to zoom in on implementation. And when you talk about implementation, let's break it down because it looks like a very big word. So you need to look at training the teachers who will implement the curriculum. Okay. Because in most cases, we have a curriculum document. We don't have the personnel. Yeah. Put it another way, we don't have personnel who are adequately trained to implement, you know, the curriculum. Mm -hmm. Then we've also talked about facilities. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, if language, which is very important, mm -hmm. is going to be a major component of the curriculum, mm -hmm. which it is, do we have language laboratories? Mm -hmm. Because it's not just about the teacher standing in front of the children to talk. Yeah, There should be a language lab mm -hmm. where you know uh, children have their uh, equipment you can put your speakers in your ear and you know listen to pronounce the words correctly and all of that do we have these facilities in place when you talk about the learning environment you know how child friendly are our learning environments you know we talk about the aesthetics we talk about the sitting arrangement I must say that in recent times, I'm happy with the strides the government is taking because mm -hmm. I've noticed that in our public schools, mm -hmm. we are becoming more and more resourceful. Yeah. So I'm happy about that. And I think it's a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. But put all of these things together, having a drive to implement will take us very, very far. So still on the issue of teachers, apart from training, what's because... Like, I'll still refer you back to private schools. Private schools, what they, before they did is just employ maybe an undergraduate that is on holiday or a graduate that is looking for work that doesn't have the training on what they are teaching. They just look at him, just employ her and just be paying her, employ him and just be paying him 30000 naira. So what advice or what idea do you think be policymakers and the government can actually put in place to, to see those teachers that are being employed by the private schools. Okay. Because it's what you have, you give. You give, absolutely, absolutely. So we have various organs of government yeah. that have been created to address these issues. For instance, you have the Department uh, of uh, Quality Assurance, okay. DQA which is a parastatal under the Ministry of Education. What the DQA does is to send inspectors to schools from time to time to inspect the school Ooh, and school. to monitor, you know, the quality yes. of education, to monitor how well the staff are qualified to deliver the curriculum. So 
again, it takes us back to the issue of implementation. Yes. Because when the inspectors go to these schools, you know, they've come to my own school on several occasions, mm -hmm. and these are the things they look out for. I don't know what happens when they go to other schools. That's good. So, but I can talk for my own school. So they are looking out for the qualifications of the teachers. Mm -hmm. Are the teachers uh, trained to teach? Mm -hmm. Or are they people who uh, maybe just are on holidays? For Come the and read ABCD for, ABCD for the students. And now, <laughs> if we have people like that in schools and uh, DQA is not pointing it out, it's a problem. Another parastata that you look at in this respect is TRCN, Teachers Registration Council of mm -hmm. Nigeria. Mm -hmm. What is their role? Mainly is to, you know, standardize the teaching profession. Yeah. And uh, what they do is that they um, give qualifications to teachers or people who are, you know, uh, desiring to be teachers. Mm -hmm. And those qualifications, you know, begin from the um, uh, colleges of education level, you know, you move to uh, degree levels, you move okay. to master's level, and then even up to, you know, doctoral PhD, levels. Yeah. Yes, so the TRCN, uh, I have, you know, my license, TRCN license. Mm -hmm. They are supposed to ensure that we do not have quacks. As teachers. Charlatans. So it's, it's a whole lot, but, you know, we're not going to achieve this um, by not being intentional about it. So we've got to go all out. We're going to comb the schools and to ensure that we are uh, fishing out schools that are contravening these directives. It's very, very important. Otherwise, you know, you keep having these this, this shows and you keep talking about, about it and nothing happens. Yeah. But being intentional about it uh, making sure that we implement to the letter is very, very key. So, like you say, you say, um, um, visitation to the school. Uh, what have been a place whereby the schools know that they are coming and they just pick like five of the best of their of their teachers? Mm -hmm. So, how how do you how do you do that? And so, what DQA does is that some of these visits are unannounced. Okay. They just you know bumping onto you without giving you any warning. One of the reasons why they do that is to ensure that people who have learned to fly without perching, you know, uh, I think it was Gino Achebe who said that uh, since birds have learned to fly without perching, hunters have also learned to shoot without missing. Yes. So the DQE can, they, they have the license to bump, you know, to just go into any school at any time without warning. And one of the reasons why they do that is to ensure that we have an educational system that is running and functioning effectively. Ideally, people who are coax are not supposed to have anywhere to hide. Mm -hmm. If some of these organs of government are doing what they are supposed to be doing properly. So, and there's this other um, problem that is arising now in private, in private primary schools. Before there's this for for junior classes like Nodri one, Nodri two, there's this Queen Premier that we all use. I use it in, in primary school. But uh, recently I noticed that have, the Queen Premier have been scrapped. They prefer to buy not the not the not the books, the education the education sec um, system actually I recommend to schools. They they decide to buy from maybe quas authors that just stand up one day and say that they have written children's book and all and, and bring it to the school to come and teach you 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 get for example you get a primary primary nursery one another one child doing five um doing 11 plus stress another one child how does another one child know 11 plus stress please so it comes back again to the dqa sincerely speaking the responsibilities of the DQA are enormous. And I don't think they are doing it. No, well, I wouldn't say they are not doing it, but more can be done. You know, the biggest room on earth is the room for improvement. Yeah. Uh, you can't, no matter what, whether you own a business mm -hmm. or you are running, you know, a school or whatever, at no time will you ever say I've arrived. You know, you mm -hmm. keep improving, you yeah. keep building on it. So. 
my advice to uh, the government, uh, and then maybe more specifically, the organs of government who are responsible for maintaining standard, would be that there is still a lot of room for improvement. Because as you said, uh, there are schools, especially in, uh, you know, the nooks and crannies yes. of some of those cities. Yes. Um, so the question is, do the officials of and these and organs they're and they're international schools? Well, of course, we say they're international <laughs> schools. But of course, you also need to look at what makes a school international. International schools, so yeah. So the curriculum, the curriculum is the number one thing that tells us whether a school is international or not. They just, they just post it on their, on their um, signpost, British and Nigerian curriculum. That is just it. That those curriculum are actually implementing it. So that is, that is it. That is, that is food for thought. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, for parents who, need, who want to prepare their children for a global world, what role can they play alongside the former curriculum? Well, first and foremost, uh, it's important that such parents are familiar with the global world, the demands of the global world. I was reading a book the other day and I came across a term that I love so much. It's called VUCA. 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 Yeah. And um, I think this word was first used by the uh, U.S. Army War College okay. after, you know, um, maybe during the at the beginning of the Cold War. Mm -hmm. And VUCA simply means that we live in a volatile, we live in an uncertain, we live in a complex, and we live in an ambiguous world. Okay. So uh, parents will do well to be enlightened, to know what is obtainable in the world, because that would also help you to choose the right school. Yes. Do you understand what you I'm saying? You know what you want for exactly, your child. Exactly, exactly. When you know where the world is going, you will not put your school, your, your child, I beg your pardon, in just any kind of school. You want to put them in a school where you are sure that the curriculum is able to prepare them for the future. Yeah, and some and some and some parents, they just feel once a school is expensive, means their curriculum is, is perfect. And not that, that, that's not necessary. I, I was talking to a colleague not long ago, and he was telling me how some of our public schools are doing so well. Yes, they are. Now he told me of a friend of his who for some reason could no longer afford private school education, yeah. and uh, they decided to move their children to a public school. Now, the shocking thing is that the public school has more equipment, more resources than the private school from which they were coming. So uh, the fact that uh, schools pay a lot of money does not necessarily mean that they are better off. I finished from, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I went to... Um, a public secondary school, school back in those days, mm -hmm. you know, and I finished from, you know, uh, command secondary school, Kaduna. Wow. Yes, and they taught us very, very well. You know, we had some wonderful teachers who I will never forget, you know, who did, you know, extensive work ensuring that we were well grouped, we were well prepared. So uh, parents need to uh, uh, remove that thinking, that disabuse their minds, from that thinking that uh, when we don't pay too much, the school is not likely to be good. Yeah. That's, that's not true. However, I must also say that there are schools um, that pay very, you know, ask for very high school fees because of the level of personnel they bring in, because of the equipment they bring in. And the quality of teachers. The quality of teachers. That's the personnel they bring yeah. in. And these people are experienced, they are professionals. They've yeah. had, you know, very, very good training, extensive training at home and abroad. Yeah. And they are preparing children for the world out there. Yeah. Those those schools charge so much because, of course, they need to run Actually, the education doesn't come cheap. Yeah, education think, is not cheap. I think I think somebody said, uh, if you think uh, education is, is it's expensive, expensive, try ignorance. ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, if there is one message you'd like to give our audience to take away about the future of education in Nigeria, what would that be? One message. The world has changed and uh, we need to 
prepare children for the changing world. The question is, is our curriculum preparing children for yesterday or for tomorrow? So my message will be that we all need to work together to make sure that our children get the best. I'm very happy about the way this uh, curriculum that will be launched in um, January 2025 was put together. Mm -hmm. Lots of stakeholders were brought in from everywhere, uh, you know, from every sector, and they put their heads together to come up with this curriculum. So let us all join our hands together to support the new curriculum. I'm told that the one for senior secondary will be ready by September of next year. Okay. Let's all work together to ensure that our children get the best. Nigeria must not carry last. So, and, and um, the new curriculum, is there, um, is there a space for language, Nigerian languages? It doesn't, we, we've always had Nigerian language. It doesn't. It doesn't. There was uh, that. there was never a teacher for a Nigerian language because back then when I was in secondary school, I registered for Yoruba, but there was never a teacher for Yoruba class. Okay, so I don't know what part of Nigeria you schooled in, but <laughs> Nabuja here. <laughs> but so in my school, for instance, we've got a Hausa, Igbo, <laughs> and Yoruba teacher, and children are free to choose whichever of those Nigerian languages they want to learn. What of international languages like French, French. Spanish? So, another thing I need to say about curriculum is that you have written and unwritten curriculum. So, in the written curriculum, you would usually have languages like French. That is standard. You have that whether in public or private schools. But then what some schools do is they run by the side, close where you teach languages like Mandarin, okay. you teach, you know, uh, languages like German, okay. you know, and so on and so forth. So that is obtainable in some of these schools. Again, that is why parents pay big money to take their children to some of these schools. Yeah, because you may not find that in some other schools. My child is speaking Mandarin. Actually, it's worth it. That is part of the global world we are talking about because what it means is that that child leaves the shores of Nigeria and is able to fit into any context anywhere in the world. Thank you very much, sir, for following our invitation. So that is all for this week. Until next week. Bye. Thank you for having me. Thank you, sir. Thank you for watching. For sponsorship and advert placements, please contact. 080-3688-6158 Last Word Leadership Podcast Studio You have the last word